in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. Today, it's uh, almost one month since the beginning of fighting in Khartoum and other cities of Sudan. And the situation is becoming worse, especially for civilians who are still in Khartoum. That was Jermaine Mouehu with the International Committee of the Red Cross in Khartoum, talking about conditions in Sudan's capital. Details coming up. Also, the United States and South Africa differ over the U.S. allegation that weapons were loaded onto a Russian vessel when it docked at a Cape Town naval base in December. And voters in Mauritania head to the polls tomorrow for legislative and local elections. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Airstrikes and artillery pounded South, South Sudan's, Sudan's capital, Khartoum, again today. The attacks come a day after Sudan's warring parties signed a commitment late yesterday on allowing humanitarian assistance. They did not agree to a ceasefire. U.S. and Saudi Arabian officials said representatives of the army and paramilitary forces, which have been fighting for nearly a month, signed a declaration of commitment to protect the civilians of Sudan in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. The agreement requires both sides to permit humanitarian assistance, allow the restoration of electricity, water, and other basic services, among other things. While the United Nations has said it expects negotiations aimed at a ceasefire will resume in the next few days, U.S. officials have indicated the two sides remain far apart on stopping the fighting permanently. The International Committee of the Red Cross welcomes an agreement signed by Sudan Armed Forces and the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces to allow much-needed aid to residents caught up in the fighting. In Khartoum, the ICRC communications officer, Germain Mouehu, says civilians trapped in cities across Sudan face serious food and water shortages. First of all, I'd like to take the opportunity uh, to welcome the Jeddah Declaration. I think it's, uh, it's one step. Uh, people expect more. They expect peace. They expect ceasefire, including uh, humanitarian organizations. We expect more. But what has been achieved so far in Jeddah, it's, uh, it's one step. We should welcome it. Now, when it comes to uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, together with Sudanese Christian Society, we are mentioned in the document, we are ready to continue working with both parties to implement what they have agreed, which means concretely to provide humanitarian assistance to those in need. The RCRC is in contact with both parties, and we expect that what they have agreed in Jeddah will be implemented in the field. Could you bring us up to speed about how civilians who are trapped in Khartoum are getting food and water supplies? Exactly. Today, it's uh, almost one month since the beginning of fighting in Khartoum and other cities of Sudan. And the situation is becoming worse, especially for civilians who are still in Khartoum. Some managed to leave Khartoum to go to other places and to go out of the country. But we still have civilians in Khartoum and other cities of Darfur affected by fighting. Now the situation is very bad because most of hospitals don't work. People don't have food, and many areas of Khartoum, there is no water, there is no electricity. And even for those who can have access to food, they don't have money because banks don't work, so people, they don't have cash. This is the situation not only in Khartoum, but also in many cities of Darfur, Nyala, Al-Fashi, al Jenina affected by fighting uh, since one month now. And other aid agencies have reported that insecurity have made it very difficult for delivery of emergency assistance. Who are you working with to ensure ICRC delivers the much-needed help to those who need them at this point? The International Committee of the Red Cross, together with the Sudanese Red Crescent Society, we have called on both parties, the armed forces and the rapid support forces, asking them to facilitate the work of humanitarian organizations. Sometimes it works, but many times due to insecurity, due to lack of security guarantees, it's very difficult for humanitarian organizations to assist those in need. 
For example, last week we managed to provide medical assistance to a hospital in Khartoum and also hospitals in Darfur. Together with the Sudanese Arkansas Society, we have started what we call management of the dead. It means to organize a burial for dead who are still in streets in Khartoum. Some the time it works, but most of the time, as I was saying, it's very difficult because we don't have enough security guarantees from those who fight, are fighting. That's Jeremy Mouwe, who ICRC's is communication officer in Sudan. He spoke with George Tanza from Khartoum a short time ago. A war of words is brewing between the U.S. and South Africa after the American ambassador said he would bet his life on U.S. intelligence that South African weapons were loaded onto a Russian vessel when it docked at a Cape Town naval base in December. The South African government hit back, saying that while it would investigate the matter, the U.S. ambassador's remarks had undermined the relationship between the two nations. Kate Bartlett has more from Johannesburg. Pretoria summoned U.S. Ambassador Reuben Bridgetty on Friday amid a diplomatic spat that has put relations between the two friendly nations at their lowest ebb in years. The Dimash was issued after Bridgetty's extraordinarily strident comments to South African media on Thursday, in which he said the U.S. had observed South African weapons being loaded onto a Russian vessel, the Lady R., which docked at the port of Simonstown in Cape Town between December 6 and December 8 last year. He said it showed South Africa was not neutral on the Ukraine conflict, as Pretoria has always claimed. Arming of Russia by South Africa with the vessel that landed in Simonstown is fundamentally unacceptable. We are confident that weapons were loaded onto that vessel, and I would bet my life on the accuracy of that assertion. The South African government seemed caught by surprise by the ambassador's comments, responding hours later that they were setting up an independent investigation into the matter led by a retired judge. But Vincent Maguena, a spokesman for President Cyril Ramaphosa, also hit back at Brigitte's remarks, saying the U.S. and South Africa had already discussed the matter privately. It is therefore disappointing that the U.S. ambassador has adopted a counterproductive public posture that undermines the understanding reached on the matter. A spokesman for the Department of International Relations and Cooperation said Friday that Minister Naledi Pandor would also be speaking to her U.S. counterpart, Secretary of State Antony Blinken. However, Corvus Mare, Shadow Defense Minister for South Africa's main opposition Democratic Alliance, said the U.S. accusations were deeply concerning. If these allegations are indeed true, it would be a gross violation of South Africa's international obligations and a betrayal of the trust of our most important trade and investment allies. There have long been questions surrounding why the ship docked in Cape Town last year. Despite Western efforts to get Pretoria's support for Kiev since the Russian invasion began last year, the South African government has maintained friendly relations with Moscow. The country's foreign minister held bilateral talks with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov earlier this year and, despite U.S. consternation, hosted Russian warships in February for joint military exercises. Stephen Grust, a Russia expert at the South African Institute of International Affairs, told VOA that Pretoria could face economic fallout from its stance. South Africa is jeopardizing its access to the American market through something like the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, those privileges could be revoked and then there would be real economic costs. South Africa also has invited Russian President Vladimir Putin to attend a summit in the country in August, despite the fact there's an arrest warrant out for him by the International Criminal Court and Pretoria is a signatory to the court. If he shows up, South Africa is legally obliged to arrest him. This has led to calls by some within the ruling party to look into restructuring the agreement with the ICC. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. As we just heard, the U.S. ambassador to South Africa, Ruben Bergetti, yesterday accused the government of President Cyril Ramaphosa of providing weapons and ammunition to Russia for its war in Ukraine. For further uh, briefing on the matter, I talked to Cindy Sain. Thank you for joining us, Cindy. So what is going on with the South African government, Russia, and what is the U.S. State Department saying about it? 
Uh, yes. Well, we've just had a flurry of, of, of diplomatic activity and uh, breaking news on this story. And uh, we had at the State Department on Thursday the deputy spokesperson, Vedant Patel, saying that uh, was was asked that the South African government says they have launched an inquiry into these reports that a Russian ship was was docked at a South African port and possibly loaded up with weapons. And uh, the State Department spokesperson Patel said, we welcome the inquiry, but he said the deeply concerning piece of this is the docking of a sanctioned Russian vessel at a South African port in and of itself. So uh, it would seem that uh, that is is a very serious matter. The U.S. is taking it very seriously. We just now had a gavel, gaggle with the White House National Security Council spokesperson, John Kirby, and he was asked about this and said he did not want to go into private diplomatic conversations, but he did say that the U.S. has consistently warned countries not to uh, arm Russia and said we've consistently asked people not to make it easier for Russian President Putin to kill innocent U- Ukrainians. So, uh, yeah, this this is a, uh, a sort of a war of words, uh, as, as we can tell. Talking about uh, President Ramaphosa, his office said yesterday that there were currently no evidence to support allegations that arms were loaded onto uh, this vessel, given the fact that South Africa follows a a neutral stance on the war in Ukraine. Right. I mean, uh, South Africa is is not uh, um, not denying that this vessel, Russian vessel known as the Lady R, was docked there. Uh, As you said, the presidency statement says it's public knowledge. Uh, The statement says... No evidence has been provided to date and that the government has undertaken an independent inquiry. But uh, the opposition in South Africa has said, uh, you know, even when this happened in December, was questioning why it was there and is saying uh, either the government very well knew about this, that this was a sanctioned vessel, or they don't know, and and that's also not a good thing. And the the opposition has said that the South African government is putting uh, economic relations, trade relations with the U.S. at risk. That was VOA State Department correspondent Cindy Sain speaking with me earlier today. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Mauritanians are getting ready for early legislative elections on Saturday. The para, para, parliamentary term was scheduled to end in August, but an agreement was struck to hold an early vote to avoid the rainy season when some regions can become difficult to access. For VOA, Noura Hafaida has more. Mauritanian's President El Ghazwani dissolved the National Assembly and called for early legislative regional and municipal elections. The International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFES, say there are over 1,500,000 registered voters. They'll choose candidates to fill for 571 seats on the legislative, regional, and local levels. In the lead up to the polls, the opposition is accusing the government of violating an argument to reform the election system and complained of government intimidation of voters. Saeed Hashim is a member of the Mauritanian opposition. Indeed, at the beginning of this campaign, the opposition issued statements from several political parties warning against adopting proportional representation. And the Prime Minister made a clear statement in which he said that the government has not forgotten those who did not elect them as the ruling party. The opposition warned and continues to warn of serious ethical violations made by the government during the campaign. The upcoming vote is characterized by intense competition among the majority parties. A challenge is facing the ruling al Insaf or Equity Party, especially after some of its members decided to withdraw and run as independents. The party recently suffered from a wave of anger from members and their withdrawals 
after announcing its candidates for the municipal and parliamentary elections. Fatima Sidi Mohamed El Fil is a candidate of the women's list for the Progress Party. For municipal elections, 20% of the seat are set aside for women. There is still a lot of ambiguity in this election because there are parties that were small and not strong but have gained momentum because new voters are coming to them. The President of the Republic, Mohamed Wild Sheikh Azahwani, has confirmed that the upcoming legislative, regional and municipal elections represent an unprecedented exception in the history of the country. He says they are the first to take place with full agreement between all political actors based on a documented consensus on the rule and conduct. 25 parties are competing in the polls. The elections come a year before presidential polls. The vote is seen a serious test for the government because it's come a year before the presidential polls. It also provides an opportunity to usher in new majority to rules Mauritania. For Voice of America, I'm Noura Hfaiz in Hamamet, Tunisia. As Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi starts his campaign for a third term, his only competitor, Ahmed Al-Tantawi, has said two of his uncles and several friends and supporters have been detained in recent days. Al-Tantawi is a former member of parliament and lives abroad in exile. Mohammed Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt's Liberal Party, of reform and development, told VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi that this measure is causing concern, but there is no fear of arresting potential presidential candidates as it happened in 2018's presidential campaign. We are concerned about what happened to Tantawi's family. Some of them have been released yesterday. Others, I believe, they will be cleared and released soon. And I believe Tantawi will come back to Cairo in days, whereby if he will finally decide to run, I don't think he will have a problem. Simply because I think what has happened in 2018 will not happen again. Time has changed and everyone is watching and people expect to see a real election, free and fair, and also observed by local and maybe international too. So I think we will not see what has happened before on this coming election in 24. Some Egyptian analysts argue that with your extensive political and parliamentary experience, you can be a perfect candidate for 2024 presidential elections. Are you thinking about that? Honestly, for the time being, I'm not considering and maybe I have no interest, but you never know. Things change. Let's wait and see. But for the time being, uh, no intention. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has initiated the National Dialogue Project last year, declaring that its goal is to open a direct channel of communication between the public and the government. However, some regional experts describe the Egyptian National Dialogue as a dialogue between the government and itself. Do you agree with that assessment? Not totally. Simply, we all have been welcoming the dialogue. This is something we were missing years back. So my opinion is some people believe nothing will materialize, nothing will really happen. But I believe we have to try our luck. I think time has come that we have to listen to each other and we have to have channels of communication trying to build trust and confidence. We all need it. And this is the only way to make any achievement and changing the current situation in Egypt, the political situation in Egypt, is to have a direct dialogue, which will start next week, although the opening ceremony have been quite inclusive. It has been with diverse representation. It looks very good. But of course, the most important, what's next? Can we come out of this dialogue with real results, which will change the whole political atmosphere? This is what we are all uh, looking for. So we have to be optimistic. I understand those who are criticizing 
those who are against the dialogue, I, I understand them, but we have no other options, which we could expect that there could be any kind of opening up. This is the only channel to try to gain some achievement. That was Mohammed Anwar Sadat, president of the Liberal Party of Reform and Development in Egypt. He spoke to my colleague Mohammed El Shinawi. And with that, we wrap up this.